Hello there. This time I'm talking about TV and films that stretch or disregard the source material. Sometimes for good, sometimes for bad. Roll the intro. What do you think the Crown will do when it finds out you're a traitor? Huh? So in light of recent events, I started to see a lot of references to The Handmaid's Tale. And I thought, Chaucer? But it's not Chaucer. I'm not going to explicitly spoil The Handmaid's Tale, but if you do want to watch it, well, I'm talking about it. The TV series is set in the not incredibly distant future, in a world that has drastically decreased fertility rates. The United States has fragmented into several competing nations. In Gilead, a theocratic tyranny occupying New England and beyond, women are second-class citizens, and the ones able to have children are used as breeding stock. So having really only heard of The Handmaid's Tale, I thought I'd watch it, and I watched season one in a single day. I thought it was brilliant. The acting, the ideas, the tone and constant dread. The only thing I could really criticise was it had a season one budget, and sometimes you can tell. Tiny criticism. One of the best first seasons I've ever seen. That <clears throat> but then... Season two quickly loses narrative pace and often feels like we're treading the same ground. Characters escape, are recaptured, escape, in a way where you suddenly realise the last three episodes have been kind of pointless. Season 1 is great at making the audience despise Gilead and the various antagonists, and Season 2 is good at that too, but we've already done it. By the end of Season 3, we want the Handmaids to escape, we want Gilead to fall, but we wanted that early in Season 1, and there have been few meaningful events that have changed our perceptions of the show's world, our understanding of the characters, or that have pushed things forward. It gets bogged down. For me, by the third season, The Handmaid's Tale was really frustrating to watch because it's still really well acted, the ideas are still interesting, but I felt as though it was wasting my time. After catching up and finishing season four, I looked up the source material, the book of the same name. The story there ends in season one. Like a lot of science fiction, the point isn't really to have an epic story, it's to build a convincing and thought-provoking alternate world. You can do that really well with a relatively short novel or series with a strong but simple story. This is the world. Isn't it awful? How can I escape? If you're going to give me 40 plus hours of TV, things better happen too. You can't end every episode with Elizabeth Moss looking like she's angry and about to do something, only for that repeatedly to not happen. Essentially, they took the source material and then added their own sequels to it, which would be fine with story ideas. With a fifth season on the way, it looks like it'll end not with the defeat of Gilead, but when the show becomes unprofitable. That's fine for friends, not for Lost. Handmaid's doesn't disregard its source material, it adds on to it with a disappointing lack of creativity. A truer example of the source material stretch might be The Hobbit. What are potatoes? Oh, potatoes! Oh, right, I obviously know what potatoes are. The Hobbit source material, The Hobbit, is about a quarter of the length of The Lord of the Rings, yet pursuit of the incredible success of The Lord of the Rings trilogy of movies led producers to stretch out The Hobbit into a trilogy of its own, despite the director's reluctance. The result is The Lord of the Rings films offer a finely told and carefully paced epic story that does indeed feel epic, but that is constantly engaging. The Hobbit films, on the other hand, are meandering and filled with events that are really just there to warrant there being three films. The reason The Hobbit films and The Handmaid's Tale TV series 
have been stretched out is purely greed. Three films will make more money than one film. Why have a TV series that's critically acclaimed with a definitive end at season three when people will watch Dross forever? The Wheel of Time is a little more baffling. Robert Jordan's series of 15 fantasy novels offers an enormous amount of characters, world, and events. Any adaptation would never need to stretch the source material, but the Amazon TV series for some reason tells a different story to the first book, almost as if the idea is, hey, what if we make the Wheel of Time as if we read the books in a parallel dimension? The show conflates events and makes a big deal out of, ooh, who has the power, when there's little mystery about that in the book. I think I can sum up what's wrong with it in a simple statement. If I did not watch the show with someone who had read the books, I would not really be able to understand it. Why did they do it like that? Well, I feel like it's clear the writers knew a pitfall of adaptations is the world-building info dump where a show's first season can get bogged down in just trying to explain how things work. But probably more so, it feels like the writers and producers didn't really trust the source material. It feels like it was made by committee, with little authorship, and even less will to actually connect with the books. This adaption, adaptation, both are fine, so misspell both, is probably one of the best examples of shitting on the source material. Of course we'll never really know, but I would guess this was made because it is superficially attractive to a producer that thinks the audience are morons. It's fantasy, and there's magic and giants and monsters and big giants and monsters and magic battles. Bam! People like that. But from what I can tell, the books were so well appreciated and successful because of the deep lore and world, where Jordan was just as interested in creating and explaining whole cultures, right down to the sort of socks they wear and their thoughts on inheritance tax, as the magic and the tight-ripping action. It feels not dissimilar to Robin Hood 2018, which isn't confident enough to either be set now or actually in the age of Robin Hood, and comes across as though its name is more of a convenience than anything else. I've no doubt the Lord of the Rings films were made because producers figured they would make money, but they still feel like they were made by people who really liked the books. If you don't care about the story or setting of Robin Hood or The Wheel of Time, why make them at all? It's a bit of a shame really, isn't it? Because I guarantee there are talented filmmakers out there that would love to adapt The Wheel of Time, or whatever. Robin Hood. But I get it, it's an industry. No one really wants to direct the Gumby film, but if someone offered you the Gumby film, it would probably be the biggest project you'd ever been offered. You'd be an idiot to turn down the Gumby film. But then before you know it, you're saying, it's an honor to direct the Gumby film. I've been a fan of Gumby since childhood, even though I'm not 80 years old. Yeah, Gumby, this is the pinnacle of my career. I could win three Oscars later in my career. Gumby is it. So I get it. I mean, that's one option, isn't it? The other option is, is that the people making these things have no artistic integrity or bent at all. And that's the real truth. Do you Gumby? Also, it posits the question. If they did a Robin Hood movie set in the 21st century, would Robin Hood be hitting Brinks trucks? Would we have a scene where the Merry Men are in HSBC corporate and Friar Tuck's there with a bong talking to Little John about Fallujah as they crack the cartel safe, all beneath a wanted poster of Hood that says, Don't trust this communist. Joe Pesci as Friar Tuck, Vincent D'Onofrio as young Friar Tuck. But source material does not have to be religiously followed or replicated for an adaptationing to succeed. Frank Darabont's film of the Stephen King novel, The Mist, changes the end in an important way, but in a way that King himself thought was superior. You might argue that what is added doesn't change most of the story, but might change most of the meaning. Kubrick's adaptation of The Shining changes things enough for King 
writer of that novel too, to at one time complain the meaning was changed. The main character is treated far more sympathetically in the book, and later in the film many of the book's explicit supernatural elements are omitted. I'm not sure the film undermines or undoes the book, but it is different, and it does work as its own thing. Another gay Kubrick romp is A Clockwork Orange, also based on a book. The book of A Clockwork Orange is often praised for its use of creative, Russian-ish slang, a la Droogies, and that appears in the film, but that isn't why the film is interesting, or dare I say, artistically superior. The film's world is painted with a fine brush and a more considered hand, but critically dispenses with the book's last chapter entirely, instead leaving the audience to wonder what crimson wonders will come next, and it's far more impactful because of it. Jaws, a tightly told and tense film, doesn't just use the book it's based on as a jumping off point, but it definitely does its own thing, and thank God, because I'd rather play Desert Bus than read that again. But perhaps the best example of a film based on a book that does its own thing, and is really, really better for it, is Starship Troopers. The book is a military sci-fi novel that follows a soldier during a massive war between humans and aliens. It is often criticised as being pro-authoritarian and in many ways reactionary, and its ideas on social Darwinism and the military of 2700 AD come across as unironic and honestly naive. Paul Verhoeven's film, Starship Troopers, takes the source material and presents it with bucket loads of irony. You can talk all day about what it's really about, but if I may quote someone else, who I met in a bar, it's a film about Americans being Nazis. Hey, it's a film about Americans being, uh, you know, like the Nazis, you know? It's how I heard it. I like fucking French. Or you might say the book is pretty obviously anti-communist, and the film is pretty obviously anti-fascist. And that change, while keeping much of the book's other ideas and themes, makes for a more thought-provoking and funny film than a direct translation would. It's like if you did a film adaptation of Mein Kampf directed by John Waters. Think about that. Uh, so, is there a conclusion to this? Yes, but it's not a very good one. Sometimes, sticking to the source material is a good idea. Sometimes it's a bad idea. This is art, there are no hard rules that are applicable all of the time. It's all a rich tapestry, blah blah blah. So, you know. Thanks for watching. Thanks to everyone on Patreon for being patient with me as I don't upload every week right now. I'm moving again. Also, Gary Sinise as Hitler, Nathan Lane as Goering, Idris Elba as Goebbels, and me, George Schmidt, as Il Duce. Just for a couple of scenes, you know? Hey, look, if they can do that accent in Frasier 30 years ago, why can't I do it now? Do you want to hear my Apu impro- No, wait! We're gonna need a bigger boat. Hello, John Gordon, you mouth. Ah. Hello, John Gordon, you mouth. Ah. You go to bed a mess in a carpet. You go to bed a mess in a carpet.